Cumbia. Ya estando la música ya, ya no es Cumbia. I love Michelada. Cumbia. What's up? What's up? Welcome to the I Love Michelada show. Thank you. Yeah, man. I'm we got to be Richard here. Parks. The Richard, third. Or the third. Yeah. Yeah, we, we couldn't get the we couldn't get you the know junior why? here. Because everybody's named Richard Parks. <laughs> really? That's what Wesley Avila told me when, when we did the Gorilla book, and he he insisted on putting my name on the cover, and he was like, "You're not just gonna leave the three off, are you?" And I was like, "I don't know. I feel kind of silly." <laughs> and he was like, "No, everybody's named Richard Parks," and so. He's a smart guy with branding. I trust him. You need three, you know, those three names. Right, exactly. Richard Parks the Third. I mean, my name is Richard Hill Parks the Third, but Damn. if you go by that, you're just asking to get smacked. You know? <laughs> Everyone thinks that I have a trust fund. You know, I'm out here, I'm out here working fund. for the money. Okay. Hey, you're out here shaking it. You're out here on podcasts. That's right. Yes. Richard's famous food podcast. Did but I get it right? You, yes, you did. Right, I was for practicing. the first time, we were practicing off camera. <laughs> I appreciate the work that you put hey, in. Hey, man, listen, I'm very committed to my craft. Thank you. Check it out on iTunes. Check it out on iTunes. Or wherever you get your podcast. Are you on Spotify? We're on Spotify, yeah, absolutely. You're everywhere. Yeah. Everywhere Every, they're everywhere not. Everywhere you can get it, I think you can get me. Yeah. Oh, well, I got you here now. That's right. So I got it straight from the source. Nailed to the cross. I'm nervous. <laughs> we, you're gonna you shouldn't be. <laughs> First thing we're gonna do is drink. Let's just drink. Okay. You're nervous. I'm gonna relax you. I'm good at that. You brought this beer. Yes, I did. I like it. Yeah. So this unfiltered is unfiltered uh, pilsner. Well, I, I went in and I said, like, look, I think I'm hanging out with something of a beer nerd today. I'm not really that. I'm like, I'm, I'm becoming more and more because everybody, everybody brings different beers. How many beers have you beers? drank just on this show? How many? Just on this show? Beers? I don't know. Probably we've, this. This is probably like, you're, no, we've done 25 already. Yeah, probably 20, 25. Does it make a difference when you do this? Do, do people just do that for no reason? I, or? I, you're Nobody probably, knows, right? yeah, I don't know. Do you do it? You do I, it? I never do it. Okay. I remember <laughs> seeing people do it. I'm like, what'd you do? They're like, I don't know. It's kind of like when people shake their cigarettes. Yeah, right, exactly. Or well, like when you take a pack of sugar and, and you just, you shake it up real good before well, you get that matters. Yeah, oh, you, did, you gotta get it to the bottom of the pack. That one actually makes sense, right? Man, so unfiltered pilsner. Yeah, from, from San Pedro. San Pedro. Yeah. Pop Fuji. So, cheers. You haven't had this. I want to try the beer by itself first. Okay. Me too, because I'm on his show. I don't know. That's just how. What do you so. think of the beer? Um. You're a food, you have a food like podcast. Beer. Yeah, yeah. The funny thing is, I'm so bad with food words because <laughs> people are like, oh, you write about food. I guess, well, please describe this. And, like, you know, like, I'm not Jonathan Gold. I'm not trying to be Jonathan Gold. Yeah. You know, he's him. <laughs> I'm. Um, You're Richard Parks. Yeah. The third. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean. My nephew's the fourth. Oh, really? Yeah. And, like, and my, my, Does sis, he use my that? sister, well, he's, he's like four, so I don't know. I don't know if he's still easy yet, young. Yeah. but my sister's adamant about it. Like it's always like at yeah, the fourth. Yeah. Um, what, what are you getting out of this? What do, do we? Do it's good. I mean, tasting it's, notes. I'm the same way. I'm like really horrible at like you know, but it tastes really good. I mean, it, it does taste like a it's honey. Yes. I it, I get honey out of it. And I get like there's almost like a, a round mouth feel and like like a like a like a weight to this beer. Yeah. Like it's not like crisp and cutting through. No, it's no, no yeah. Like sitting and, and yeah. kind of like coating. It's definitely, yeah, you're right. You're right. It's round. It's not sharp. It's round. <laughs> what they say? Uh, Round is one of my favorite food words, actually. Really? Yeah. Well, I think it's a mouthfeel thing. Like, There's that meme it's where it's like, uh, "warm water's round, cold water's pointy." That's true. Yeah. When you're in the shower, you soft water and hard water. Mm -hmm. You know the water that like feels like it won't get off. Yeah. That's what they call soft water. I yeah. think. Yeah. No, I think that's hard. I just bathe in olive oil. <laughs> you look like yeah, it. I'm a foodie. <laughs> and then you go in the oven. Yeah. And that's right. how you get this beautiful color. Slow and low. <laughs> <laughs> this is good, man. I like it. But good, now it's, a, it's a I love Michelada show. So now we gotta. So now we gotta make it to Michelada, dude. So we're mm. actually using our brown today. Oh look, you gotta put the hot sauce. Oh on. man, Thank we're you, gonna. Man. Hold on one second. Oh wait, uh, what is this beautiful hot sauce? Oh, he's doing it. Not too much. Actually, it's really good. A lot of um, fermented habanero and garlic. Do you make it yourself? Yes, I did uh, at home. Uh, mixed with sweet potato and mango to sort of like Ooh. take the heat down a little bit. And then I cooked it down with um, peaches and lime. Peaches and lime? Yeah. How long did it take you? What's, what's the a process several step like? process. I mean, so I fermented the chilies and the garlic for like 60 days. Jesus. Yeah. On the but countertop. But that you just put it there and you walk away. That's all you do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's not an FDA approved situation. Okay? <laughs> um, and, uh, and, but then I added the, I, I talked to a fermentation maestro named Sandor Katz. He's the guy who wrote the book, The Art of Fermentation. Actually, he's featured on my podcast. I went to his his house in Tennessee. He lives up in the hills somewhere. He lives off the grid. Right next to the Tabasco factory? 
It's far away from everything. It's like you're cheers. out there. Okay, cheers. It's on the rim, so I don't know if you're gonna go rim side or non rim side. What, what, how, how much do you like your own should, hot sauce? I mean, it might blast out like any flavor let's because try it's it. pretty. All right, let's do it. It works. Yeah, I like it. I think it's. Wow, it really works. I think it's actually opening up the pilsner. Sure. Make it a little less round. <laughs> a little more pointy. That's right. <laughs> I like it. It's good. Thank you. I How did you get into stuff. food? Were you always into food? Did you, have you always eaten? <laughs> or is that something new you've gotten into? Well, yeah. My love of food, I think, comes from from the home, you know, from, from you, my did, parents. Was it always home cooking in your house? Well, like the always, kind of thing where... Dinner every night, you know. And, and Were you a participator? <laughs> I, I ate. Yeah, absolutely. No, I mean, in the cooking side. Yeah, I mean... There's even photos of me like doing things with mixing bowls and stuff, so I guess so. You know, I don't know if I always was like completely obsessed by food the way I am because, you know, for me, food is more the lens for stories and experiences, but stories about people and culture. Mm. Uh, you know, less so than than the food criticism stuff, or or um, that's what that's how I got into food as an adult is someone who writes and makes podcasts and cookbooks and stuff like that about food. It was through, you know, using it as a lens to talk about culture and people. But when I was a kid, it was like, yeah, dinner was a huge deal. It was like, I grew up in the 80s and 90s um, in LA, like in Hollywood. But uh, if you look at photos of us, it's more like the 1880s or 1890s. <laughs> Why? It was just a very, uh, you know, even though it was like in LA and there was sort of all that stuff around, it was also a very sort of like quiet, almost okay. like parochial existence. It's like potatoes and meats. We had a gar we were on the front page of the gardening section. Really? Of the LA Times, when the LA Times had a gardening section. Were you on the picture or just your, your I parents? I was, yeah. Uh, yeah, well, I forget what my quote was, but it was, it was memorable to everyone else. <laughs> no, yeah. Was, wearing a McCabe's guitar shop shirt nice. on the photo in the LA Times. But it looks like, it literally looks like American Gothic. It's like my dad's got a hoe and my mom's got a rake and me and my sister are in overalls. And um, yeah, we grew a lot of our own food and uh, dinner was very formal. Okay. It was like sit down, you know, say a prayer and, and like speak when spoken to and like mm. sir and ma'am and like, you know, a very sort of, um, you know, a, a, a upbringing that I think is out of another time and place. Then I like it. I, I I very much appreciate it. Yeah. I I always feel like kids always kind of tend to rebel at some point, right? Right. Did you rebel against that sort of? My form of rebellion would be like you know. Would you go in and out? Grace. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> oh yeah, in and out was huge. But like, what was your form of rebellion towards that like vegetable fresh cooking? Would you go like? <laughs> would you go to like the frozen section of the of the deli of like the Ralphs and get like frozen pizza or? Sure, Celeste pizzas, like the, the French toast pizzas. I don't know if you remember those. No, but like the my, French toast frozen pizzas. Oh man, those are a huge deal. I'm into Red Barons. That's that's oh, my okay. guilty pleasure. All right, yeah. Um, I don't know what it was. I mean, there was always a little pleasure mixed in there. You know, I thought that Haagen Dazs was like my family's special word for ice cream. <laughs> like when I heard someone else say Haagen Dazs, I was like, how do they know? <laughs> I don't think that's, know. that's our special word that's for what we, say. That's what we call yeah. ice cream. You know, I thought it was our word. Um, but you know, so there was that too, uh, but Richard's Famous, the name of my podcast and um, maybe the name of this hot sauce that I'm glad to hear you will be doing a licensing deal on. Yes, uh, yeah, I'll be the distribution deal. Paper. Okay, cool. Um, started it as, as this salad dressing that I wanted because I love Newman's own salad dressing. <laughs> Fresh dill from the garden, Roquefort, yeah, use a, a egg yolk to make a mayonnaise and uh, lots of fresh lemon and it's just sort of acidic, funky, salty. And uh, like I wanted to, I wanted that to be my, my livelihood. Is that and you, you, you would make, you actually make it? Would you ever sell it? Would you, would, would I, you like slang dressing at school? Right, yeah, I'd go to school and be like, hey, check it out. I know you have Gushers, but I have Richard's famous Roquefort <laughs> <laughs> salad dressing. No, but I don't know. Food was very political at, on the schoolyard. Do you really? remember that? Oh, for sure. You know, one of my- Cool Ranch Doritos, Gushers, and like leftover McDonald's were the coolest things you could what have. What grade are you talking? I mean, I'm born in 1982, and this is probably when I was in like first grade or whatever. So uh, it's probably like 1989 or something. You're OG. Like I remember, yeah. I, I never sold candy. I, I, all my friends sold candy. That was yeah. like a thing. When I was in high school, there was a, a, a code where you couldn't have a, a, a food truck parked next to a school. Yeah. So I got the food truck's guy's cell phone number, <laughs> and I would take people's orders, 
I would text him the orders, yeah. and he would throw over the burritos over the, the fence. And then you got a piece, or what? Yeah, I got a cut. You got a kickback? Yeah, back? I would have kickback. That's the, <laughs> the budding businessman. Yeah, I love was, it. That yeah. was the first venture. <laughs> That's so good. But we went to this pediatrician, Paul Fleiss. Heidi Fleiss's dad, the Hollywood madam. Remember Heidi Fleiss? I don't know. Okay, well, she was brought into court, and there was like a television. Uh, you know, it was one of the sort of big... You're a little bit younger than I am, but growing up in LA, like this was covered okay. on TV. And you went uh, to her dad's pediatrician. Her dad was a pediatrician, uh, and he had a clinic. And at some point, I think in in sort of like certain circles, it was like very hip to send your kids there. You know, it was like sorry because my parents lived through this sort of like 70s of Were LA. Were your parents like, cool? They are cool. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. They were like in the in the scene. Yeah, well, so I think like health food and sort of like the, the, yeah, I mean, they were what people would call hippies, although they would never okay. ascribe to that label. They just, that was their lifestyle. Yeah, you know, it was just like 60s, you know, like my mom learned how to drive in a car that Timothy Leary gave her, you know, like stuff like okay. that. There's some stories. All right. You should have her on. <laughs> um, but then if you meet her today, you're like, what a nice, lovely old lady. <laughs> she does watercolors. Um, no, but That's Paul Fleiss was like sort of, he was against refined sugar. He was sort of more about like homeopathic treatments and like more of a little bit of an Eastern perspective and okay. like holistic medicine approach than traditional like Western medicine. And uh, his daughter, the Hollywood madam, the story of Heidi is, is that um, she like basically had a high end escort service and her clients were like, I mean, I know Charlie Sheen was involved in that. Oh. And like, she sort of famously was, he involved in? Uh, was investigated and, and tried for this and it was on television. So most people know her, but don't know about Paul, but Paul, you know, wouldn't allow us to have refined sugar. And so that was like part of like the regime of, um, of growing up. Okay. And, uh, but the Shishmanians, our next door neighbors, the first Armenian couple I ever the knew. Shishmanians. Yeah, and they didn't speak any English and I didn't speak any Armenian. Mr. Shishmanian had like, was the tallest, skinniest guy you'd ever seen <laughs> with hair coming, out of, hair coming out of his ears. And Mrs. Shishmanian was this, you know, plump, you know, a very buoyant, like lovely lady. But like, but it was always like, come into so our they house had a and sitcom. eat these treats. Yeah, they should have. Yeah. But just, um, you know, they were the ones that, like, I would come back from their house with chocolate smeared all over my face. And my parents would, have you been at the Shishmanians' house again? So that's how I rebelled, probably. Oh, is going to I have. Yeah. Where, meet the Shishmanians. That's, you that's the intro. Get, you can always get a Milky Way bar at the Shishmanians' house, and I learned that early on. All right. But yeah. I like that. Yeah, so that's a little about me. That's how you got into the... And how did, when did you start writing about food? I mean, I've always written, so, you know, it was just more, like, general... You know, I worked at newspapers. Um, what was your first writing? What was the first time you got paid for writing? I wonder what my first check was. That's, I mean, my first job um, and my only job to this day, because <laughs> I stopped working after that, was as a reporter for the Benicia Herald. Benicia is a small town in the Bay Area, about a half an hour um, north of, of uh, San Francisco and Oakland. And it, it was the state capital for two years in the 19th century. But this is a place where, you know, like in 2006, and if you were 24 years old, you could get a job as a, as a reporter, as an entry-level reporter. And so that was your first job? That was my first job. What, what, what did you write? What was your beat? I was the school's reporter. And the first day, I went in for an interview, and the guy was like, when can you start? Tomorrow? And I was like, <laughs> ah. And I started the day after tomorrow, and I went in, and he asked me to write three things that day, and I was like, terrified, you know? <laughs> John Moses, he was like, yeah. So, and this was right after college? Yeah, pretty much. Right after college, I went and made a documentary with some friends um, in Texas. What documentary? Wait, wait, hold on. <laughs> uh, wait, for, 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 real quick, finish the story about the... the, the, the oh, the first day on the job? Better, yeah. Well, it's, it's the best learning experience you can get because he was like, write three things by 4 p.m., you know? And you're like, what are you talking about? And we didn't have the internet, and, it just, <laughs> and my desk had a Rolodex on it. And I was like, you know, I'm like... Although I have gray hair, I'm technically a millennial. And, you know, I was not excited about like picking up the phone. And I've noticed that a lot of new reporters, people who are getting into this, like, you know, they just don't know how to pick up the phone and talk to people, but like I had to. Yeah. And what are the uh, three stories you wrote? One was the planning commission look forward. And I was like, what are you planning commission look for? What is that a sentence or, you know, um, one of the city agencies that you know uh, governs like things like zoning for houses and businesses and so forth I was having a meeting and so we got the agenda for the meeting and uh, I just 
look down the list and whoever's name was on that piece of paper, I just called them and <laughs> asked them inane questions and, and wrote something about, I don't know, you know, it was probably something about, you know, like the facade of a house on East 2nd Street, uh, you know, like, like such and so resident wants to modernize it, but his neighbors say, <laughs> you know, and that kind of thing. And it's like, you, it's news. It's like, you find a thing Hyper -local. that's happening. Very local. Yeah, yeah. And, um, but seeing how much like that community and then later I moved to a paper uh, in Martinez and when I was 25, I was the editor of the Martinez News Gazette. <laughs> and people, and I, I still had a baby face and, and just a couple gray hairs you back still then. still have a baby face. But in Martinez, people like count how long they've lived in Martini, Martinez by the decade. You know, so they'd be like, let me meet the, the new reporter. And they would come in and take a look at me and be like, where's, you know, where's, the, where's the editor? Excuse me, young man, where's the editor? Yeah, excuse me. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. It was that. And it was like, you know, trying to gain respect through the work, but uh, very formative. Anyway, that was my first day on the What show. was your documentary you director? You, you, you buried yeah. the lead here, man. You, you directed a documentary when you were young? I did not direct it. I, I, it. Me and two friends went out and just started making it, having no idea what, what we was were it about? doing. So, um, in the, in the or rather, what did it start being? What did you guys yeah. think it would be about? And what did it end up being about? Yeah, we actually carried that through amazingly. But um, in, in 1997, uh, in West Texas, the most remote and one of the most beautiful places I've ever been, it's basically if you followed the Rio Grande from El Paso just for two hours, you're, all of a sudden you're in the middle of nowhere. And, um, you know, it's one of these border areas where the border is a porous thing, you know, as we know. And it's yeah. like people live on one side, they live on the other side, they go across for their medicine, whatever. You know, it's one of those areas. But in, in the 90s, um, it was under the Clinton administration, uh, some military were sent down there to uh, assist with the border patrol. It was called Joint Task Force 6, and it was six different governmental agencies aligning to supposedly do surveillance on the border. And these Marines that were sent down there, who themselves were 19, 18 years old, you know, like fresh out of boot camp essentially, were given some very bad intelligence about how rife this area was with drug smugglers. So this kid, uh, who was 18 years old, named Ezekiel Hernandez, who lived in this area, whose family had, you know, and, and generations back had lived in this area of West Texas, herds goats. It's sort of part of their livelihood. He had this little 22 rifle, like a World War I era rifle. And um, some, uh, some d coyotes had been attacking his goats. Yeah. And so he saw something in the distance and he thought it was one of the coyotes. And so he just sort of took a shot at it with this little BB gun. Uh, but it wasn't anything, it, it, it was a marine in full, what they call ghillie suits, this amazing sort of camouflage where you get pieces of the chaparral. And the ones that like pop out of the floor and... Exactly, yeah. yeah. So they saw him as a threat, tracked him and shot him through the back and killed him. And that was the first death of a US citizen on US soil at the hands of the US military since Kent State. But nobody knows about it. And so, uh, so we started there. We just went down the area, we had a camera, and uh, we started asking people about this kid. It was like, you know, almost 10 years later at that point. And basically, you know, the federal government had given the family some millions of dollars as like a settlement. Compensation. And a, yeah, and like a civil lawsuit. But essentially, the story had kind of been buried, and there had been like a congressional report on it, but like, you know, it hadn't been told in a popular way. It was sort of like a headline for a week, you know? And then Did your documentary like, do something? Like, did, did it make waves? Did it, was anybody like, oh Yeah, I mean, it... It went on PBS eventually, years later, wow. and it got nominated for uh, an Emmy, and... Um, Did you yeah. win? <laughs> I was not involved at that point. I didn't stay in for the whole thing, because okay. it was like... Eventually, I had to go home and, like, start working in a magazine stand and, you know, like, <laughs> get an apartment, like, you know, get out of my parents' house. But, um, but my friends who I was collaborating with, I mean, I stayed involved, but they really... They found a way to continue it and, and finish it, which... It was an amazing. But that treat. seems very much kind of like in line of what yeah. you would, what you do now with the yeah. with the food writing, right? Uh -huh. Where it's like taking this issue and seeing it like you were saying more from the social aspect, mm -hmm. more not really criticizing, but more yeah. like telling about like what happened, how does that affect people? Right. I don't know. I think I'm kind of a journalist. You are. Lowercase J. No, why lowercase? I don't know. I, I have a master's in journalism, actually. Then you're a journalist. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm uncomfortable with terms like that. Are you uncomfortable with your own success? My success? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, you've written a book. Yeah, this great podcast. I'm very proud of the book that I worked on with uh, with Wesley Avila. I mean, it's his book. You know, it's his story. It's his food. Like that is his life in a book. Yeah. Um, I just helped him get it out. How did know? that come about? Uh, with, 
I mean, I, I was writing, you know, I was writing for magazines like Lucky Peach and when that was happening and... Um, yeah, Lucky Peach was, a, was like a crazy thing, in, moment in time, Yeah. perfect storm. You Beautiful. guys were crazy things. How long yeah. did you work there for? Uh, I mean, for, you know, I, I wrote a handful of articles there for the short life that it existed, yeah. like the four years or whatever. A friend of mine who I knew from other projects in publishing uh, this company, McSweeney's in, in San Francisco, this independent publishing company that I worked at for for years off and on on different projects. I did a crazy, I did a radio drama with the flaming lips there. <laughs> I, did, I wrote for the website. I wrote an advice column about bluegrass music for the website. Really? Yep. Yeah, well, that so was my first writing job. That was the first. Richard Parks answers your bluegrass music and bluegrass music related questions. What it kind of? A, it was an advice column. That's so niche. How, what kind of questions would you get? Well, the person who came up with that is this guy named Dave Eggers, who who started this company, who uh, is a great novelist and, and and journalist himself, and sort of a force for good in the world. But. He was like, I was like 19, I was then an intern there. And he was like, what do you know about that nobody else knows about? And I was like, <laughs> I was like, bluegrass music. And he was like, why don't you, you know, we'll do an advice column, people ask you questions, you know, you go off on tangents, whatever. And so I did it. I wrote about like why people wear hats in bluegrass bands. And why do they wear hats? It's a symbol of power, really. You know, okay. yeah, the first person, like in Bill Monroe, the father of bluegrass, he would wear the cowboy hat and nobody else would. Okay. So you knew who was boss. And it kind of comes out of just, I mean, really, the whole cultural, like, image of a cowboy comes from Mexico, like, way long ago. Like, ever, like so many things in culture, it's like, we've been, you know, America's been around for like 200 years and we assume <laughs> that everything just showed up or whatever. But, you know, it, most of the stuff comes from somewhere else a long time ago. And, um... But it was that image of and cowboy culture that you know. The person they, they used to wear jodhpurs, you know, like the little like riding chaps with like the like when you see like someone riding like English style horses, the khaki pants. Ah, okay, the, okay, with the with the wear, big thigh. Yeah, so area. they wore those and like riding boots, and you know, and it was like this weird kind of you know like quite effeminate, uh, you know, um, but very you know masculine culture. Uh, but it was you know it's symbolic, right? So. What was your question? Why are we I forget. Oh, I you're, what, what is it that, uh, what kind of advice would you give people? Like, oh. what would people ask? Besides, you said, why mm -hmm. do bluegrass players wear or hats? What kind of other questions would they ask? For such a, it just seems like such a niche. Yeah, it was, and that's part of why I didn't know what it was. And I was like, you know, I was so young, and it was like, I think Dave saw something, you know, and I don't know if I ever got it, you know, but that's kind of my... <laughs> I how long did that run I, for? I would describe my relationship with Dave totally is that, you know, it was the same thing with the Flaming Lips thing. He's like, yeah, so Wayne Coyne, the lead singer of the Flaming Lips, wakes up one day and he has a, a thing in his leg and it looks like a face. And you're there and you're the reporter uh, and it's a radio drama and, and, you're, uh, and you're reporting about that. But then musicians show up and they sing to it. <laughs> and, and it lasts an hour. And like, I went out of the meeting for that and I was like, what are what am I gonna do? You know, and so that did was you have to write the whole thing? I wrote it with with Dave's help and some friends, and uh, I I acted in it, and I got all these bands to play music, and and it was very weird, and uh, it was on KCRW. Man, your life is everywhere. Yeah, I'm a little. I think I'm a generalist. <laughs> with a lowercase g. All right, so you start writing for Lucky Peach. Yes, you do oh, right. these things, and then how do you meet Wes? How do we meet Wes? Um, well, yeah, so I was I was writing a lot of like. You know, some food stuff, because I always love writing about food, but as I said, I worked for newspapers, wrote about a lot of things. Do you um, remember the first time you wrote about food? I think the first big article that I wrote about food was about Martin Picard, who, um, he is a, a Quebecois chef, because I had gone to college in Montreal, Canada. And, and so again, it's like, there's a whole culture there that exists nowhere else. Like, mm -hmm. French Canada is fascinating, and like, does not get its do at all, I think, in the wider popular consciousness, like it can almost be like the butt of a joke, because it's like not France, you know, but like, there are these fascinating traditions and turns of phrase and accents and, uh, you know, styles of like clothing and, and, and with hairstyles that food. and food, and the food there is amazing. Cause like comfort food, like what's something that like you can only find there? Well, like poutine is the the most most famous example, which mm -hmm. is French fries, cheese curds, and gravy. Mm, I like that. You know, so kind of like if you, maybe you run across them, you know, here is disco fries, <laughs> you know, <laughs> disco fries, or like chili cheese fries. You know, it's kind of like in that world. But cheese curds, 
have a whole currency in Canada that we don't even know about. You can go to a gas station and get, it's like corn nuts. Really? Yeah, and, and everybody knows what makes a good cheese curd. Okay. When you bite into it, it has to squeak. <laughs> and it's like, we don't have that culture around like dairy, Yeah. you know, here, like, like or at least we don't share that as, as you know, across regions, and, but Canada does. It's a small, it's a huge place, but it's smaller in ways, you know, okay. and, but French Canada, these great like rich comfort to uh, comfort food dishes or like a tortiere which is like a minced meat pie very uncool food you know but delicious and when you like work all day and it's 40 below there's nothing like that you know <laughs> and so he's famous for that and, and sort of extravagant plays on that a lot of foie gras you know things like a dish that he had that i don't know if it's still on the the restaurant still exists but i don't know if it's still on the menu pig's head for two you literally get a pig's head. Okay. And there's like a, a lobster tail hanging out of the mouth. <laughs> and, and the dude's just crazy, right? You know, but it's like, he's like a scoffier, like on acid, you know, because he has access to like everything. But it comes out of like these French traditions. Um, it's like being French tradition, but outside of it. Like you're free, yeah. you're free to do whatever you want, but you still have the techniques and stuff. Totally, yeah, yeah. It's sort of like, I mean, I think it's like a, you know, there's like a music analogy in there where it's like based on a genre that you might know, <laughs> but just with no rules, you know? Yeah. You know, um, like at one point, I think we would have said Kanye, but I think he's kind of lost uh, cachet with me a little bit uh, recently. Anyway, um, not to go off on another tangent. but I, I, So back so to I, the story. But I knew about this guy because I lived there. And I was like, nobody in America knows about that. Yeah. And I have to confess, it's my one and only crazy chef profile because I think that's a really tired format. No, it's like, look at this crazy guy. He <laughs> drinks so much and look at his crazy food. And But I wrote... A, a short article about him, a profile uh, for this magazine called Meat Paper, which was also a sample. Meat Paper? Yeah, it was like a great it. magazine, kind of like Lucky Peach in a way, and a precursor to it. Just like great design, but it was all focused on meat or fake meat or whatever. Or paper. Yeah, so I had, exactly, yeah, yeah, it should have been. <laughs> it was a great paper object. <laughs> but um, so I'd written that and written other things, and then. Um, an editor who, Wes had already gotten a book deal okay. uh, for the Gorilla Tacos cookbook. Um, when he still had the food truck and, um, you know, it was just a very buzz about, it was like Jonathan Gold's number 13 restaurant or whatever, but it was yeah. just a food truck and, and like, this is like a famous story. And um, he had sold a book based on that and he had a publisher and the publisher, the, the editor who was assigned to the book at the publisher knew my work and we had a meeting we just ah, okay we met at his house and i gave him like i just did you i gave him some fermented hot sauce <laughs> and we talked and then we talked again and then uh and he was know, like yeah it's my he guy. was interviewing people and yeah and then yeah. yeah he trusted me and uh i mean he's it's a great book well i have the book it's on the um on my kitchen where in, on my pile of cookbooks i'm honored <laughs> I, I will sign it for you. Uh, that's why I'm bringing it out. <laughs> you know, you already uh, signed it. Uh, oh, really? I did? Yeah. Okay, good, good, good. Look, I've signed a lot of books. Okay? <laughs> I'll sign anything. Uh, so then, and then that's how that came about. What was the process like? What, what is the... Uh, writing this book? We have it right here. Yeah. Mm. Well, um... Richard Parks the third. Which we talked about earlier. Well, first I had to come up with all the recipes. <laughs> Personally? Yeah, yeah, right, absolutely. Uh, it's a little known uh, story about Gorilla Tacos that actually all the food is mine. Uh, no, uh, we just sit there and, you know, we, basically we started with the food because I was like, it yeah. is a cookbook. We need to get these things down. He had never written anything down. He had been doing this thing for like three years. Oh, cool. There it is. Oh, I drew my face and everything. Wow. Oh, that's rad. You got a good one. This is really, oh, you got Britney too, man. I got everybody. Love it. That's great. Um, excellent. Well, I'm not going to touch that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we started with the, the recipes and it was like, um, Wes had been doing gorilla tacos, changing the menu every day, going to the market every day and serving different tacos every day for years already. And he had never written anything down. And I was like, okay, I guess oh, we really? gotta start somewhere. And so we just went through the food, but like as we went through the food, um, and I was trying to translate it to the, to the home. Um, and also he's just such a, you know, intuitive and, and kind of like no rules kind of chef. Like, and it's certainly at that time, I think he was very free to kind of change so much that, um, 
I don't know, like it, it was like almost like it was a challenge to figure out like what is the, the snapshot that we want to take of what's going on here. Where, we, where do we pause it? Exactly, yeah, yeah. And with down to the food itself because it's like, well, if, if it's not tomatillos, maybe it's gooseberries or it's, you know, it's like he'll change things that have similar flavor profiles like constantly, he'll interchange them. But um, as we went through the food, I started to get these great stories about his life, you know, and it was like, this is the story of this person because like his personal story is so completely, genuinely connected to his food. And it's not clever at all. It's not like a gimmick, you yeah. know? It's real. It's not something it's he authentic. decided to do. It's just that he's, you know, and, and his father, he still makes stuff in this restaurant, you know, to this day that is based on that. Um, and then he loses his mother at a very early age, and that's like a super formative experience. And then he sort of loses his way. He drives a forklift. Then he gives that all up to become a fine dining chef. Then he gives that all up to start making tacos. And like, that's what Gorilla Tacos is. It's like Pico Rivera, you know, plus fine dining, like plus someone who just does it for no reason, you know, which is like the beautiful thing, yeah. you know, it's like it, he didn't do it to start a successful restaurant. He did it because it was inside of him and it had to come out, you know, and so we tried to put that in the book and sort of, um, you know, some of the personal stuff. He was like, who's going to want to hear about this? And I was like, trust everybody. Me. Like, everyone's good because, you know, you know, that guy, it's yeah. like he's so lovable. It's so easy to care about him. And so I knew that we had a good story there. And so that's how uh, that's how we organized it. That's awesome. Yeah. I think, uh, and I met one of my best friends doing it. Who? This guy. What's happening? Well, that's his, uh, his very tastefully tatted up forearm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I love that guy. He's really cool. He's he told me that if I got this tattooed, he would pay for it. Really? Did well, you? Because I don't have a tattoo and he knows that. Did you? I was thinking, like, wouldn't that be dope if I just took my shirt off right now and it's just a chest <laughs> it's, tattoo? It's the exact huge, same even size. Even bigger than this. Yeah, yeah. So what's the story behind your phallic no. uh, <laughs> uh, pickle? Uh, well, I've always made pickles in different fermented things or vinegar pickles or whatever and I would give them out to friends and then at some point I was thinking about starting a business because I, I didn't try enough different things. Is this before or after the book? Is this like just your childhood? Way before the book. Way before the book. It was like 12 years ago or something like that. I was threatening to do it and my friend James Braithwaite who I'd met in a snowball fight uh, outside of our apartments in Montreal um, is a great illustrator and he drew me as a pickle and just a pickle with a mustache. And so then years later, I never got the... Without the, without the headphones and No the headphone, mic. no microphone. Okay. He did different versions. He, he did Queen Victoria holding a little pickle like as if it was a baby, <laughs> but it had a mustache. It was like great stuff. I'll send that So one. you've always had the mustache? I've had it for a long time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you, have you always had it? When was the last time you did it? I was have born with a full, like Tom Selleck. Yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. or like that Will Ferrell skit like, on it's, SNL. It's an ugly baby, but he's going to be okay. He'll get some acting jobs. Wasn't that, 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 that skit on SNL, the Will no, Ferrell? Did, where he, he, born with a he was born as, as a grown man. He's like, wah, wah. I need a 20 dad. I'm going to Atlantic City. I was that. I was totally yeah. that. No, I mean, probably since my mid 20s. I've been messing with it. You know, various it's part of your brand now, so now you can't take it off. The mustache, you know? <laughs> but now my girlfriend, when I when I shave it off, she's like, I don't want to see you, that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's like the you've seen those videos of like a dad that shaves for the first time and the baby sees it and he's just bawling, <laughs> crying. It's funny. Kids react to it funny, you know, because so then so then you, your, your your friend makes the and when did you decide to make that into your persona, your brand? Because now that's that's you. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's all about the podcast now. So I started the podcast and it. Turned out kind of crazy, and I was. How many like, episodes are you in now? We've done twelve, and that's 12 that's the end of season one. Over four and a half years, I did. 12. <laughs> that's a long season. I put a lot into each one. I don't four know. and a half years? Yeah. Really? First one was in July of 2015. Who was it? Uh, well, it was all about bone broth. Okay. Bone broth was happening as a trend, and to me, it was, you know, what I try to do. What a lot made what? So then, what made you make a, a, a one podcast? Well, at the time, I mean, I have a Gmail label for this podcast going back like, I don't know, 10 years or something like that. I've wanted to do it for a long time. You know, I'd done the thing with the Flaming Lips and McSweeney's mm -hmm. and, and KCRW, this crazy kind of experimental, like heavily sound design, heavily musical, absurd thing. And I kind of really loved that. And um, Serial, the podcast had like blown yeah. up, changed everyone, you know, turned everyone on to podcasting. And food media was evolving in really interesting ways at the same time with Lucky Peach, you know, but also with like, you know, everything that is sort of personality driven stories about culture again, you know, like from Bourdain to even like some stuff that like Vice was doing at the time. 
but in food, so there was this great innovation happening in audio and podcasting and this great innovation happening in food and this renewed interest in food and food media. But I didn't see the food audio thing that overlapped there. Okay. You know, all the radio shows, which I love, you know, uh, like I love, you know, like KCRW, Good Food, love that show so much. Evan is my queen, you know, like my hero. And I've been honored to be on that show a couple times. But like her show and, and other shows that are on more like, you know, terrestrial radio, we're all kind of, I think, stuck in the terrestrial radio format yeah. because they're radio shows. I just wanted to do something with a little bit more personality, a little bit more of a sense of humor. And, uh, you know, I really like to inject a little bit of the funny into everything I do if I can, you know, get people to not take it so seriously. Um, and, like, then it came out the way it came out. And then it just got weirder after that. <laughs> <laughs> How long does it take you to edit an episode? Long time. Too long. Too long. Yeah. Is that why there's a four-year range yeah 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 <laughs> i mean it's and i try not to waste anyone's time you know my episodes are like 15 minutes up to like maybe less than a half an hour um but i take on a single story or a single subject and i take you on i struggle describing my podcast but i think this kind of tells you what you need to know it's a anthropomorphic pickle exactly but um a, a guy who wrote a piece of criticism about it recently said it was the first time he had heard color and I ah, think that that's I like that. kind of getting there. I, I say it's kind of like a cartoon. There's characters, there's surprises, there's tons of unexpected sounds that are like, you know, I think that probably the way I make my podcast is based on how I like watch like Warner Brothers cartoons when I was a kid, like Bugs Bunny and Wile E. Coyote and, you know, the yeah. like, it's just a funny sound, you yeah. know? And then I sing sometimes if I want to and it's like, uh, and I have a nephew who's a little baby pickle and he talks to me and it's very hard to describe. <laughs> but it's not for everybody, but I think that, I think you guys It is like for it. you. It's for you. And it is for me. Tune in. Thank you for the plug. No, it's for everybody. Where yeah. do people find you? Uh, on, on social media? Everywhere. Just uh, where I'm, uh, you know, I'm around, um, Northeastern Silver Lake a lot of the time. The Whole Northeastern Foods. Northeastern Silver Lake. <laughs> Go the Whole Foods. What, what aisle are they usually hang out in? I, I'm produce. Yeah, produce. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Because some of the farms they use, there's pretty good <laughs> deals on. No, uh, I'm online uh, at Richard's Famous. Richard with an S, Famous, okay. is my show. And then uh, me personally, if you want to get into whatever that is. It's, I uh, do. At Richard Parks, R-E-E-C-H-A-R-D-P-A-R-K-S. Because Richard Parks everybody is, is Richard Parks. Yeah. That's why I'm learning and the focus. I like that. Yeah. yeah, I should have done that. That would have been much more clever. Yeah, now I'm boxed into this thing. My, it was, it mine's is like a Simpsons reference. Is it really? Yeah, uh, it, it's like a roundabout, like not even direct. Okay, There's like an episode where uh, they're like uh, L Simpson. Wait, that's too obvious. Lisa S. So I just took that joke and just switched the. <laughs> My friend's name is Dara, but everyone calls her Dara, <laughs> and so she'll tell people, no, no, it's like Sarah with a D. And then one time someone was like Sarah. <laughs> So now I call her Sarad. I like that. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming by. Dude, I'm honored. I'm honored to be here. I'm really glad about what you were doing, you and your whole family. And, and I'm so glad that you guys are, that you're doing this to, to talk about this moment in food in LA through your lens, I think is super. Well, yeah, I just have people over and we just do this. Yeah. As you can see, this is what people want to see color. If you, if you want to hear color, listen to his podcast. And the color is actually you covered in olive oil and baked. That's, that's right, yeah. That's the color. But you guys have been listening in black and white all this time, so <laughs> see what it's like. Listen in color, or see in color here. Taste in color. I love micheladas. That's right. Thanks for coming by. Dude, thank you. Yeah. Really appreciate it. Bye-bye.